Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, Distortion and Divergence and Diversification. We're going to wait a minute to um, let a few more people dial in, and then we're going to begin. Okay, great. Well, let's get started. My name is Ted Howard, and I'm the managing editor of iTreasurer, a leading provider of information for corporate treasurers and finance professionals. I also help run several treasury peer groups for Neu Group, iTreasurer's parent company. For more than 25 years, Neu Group has been a trusted thought leader for global finance and treasury professionals. We run a network of members only peer groups covering senior level executives, functional and regional treasury, as well as finance. We now have 20 groups cutting across sectors, finance functions, global regions, with more than 450 members from 200 plus companies. Today, we're joined by three chief investment officers from Franklin Templeton Investments, Sonal Desai, Stephen Dover, and Ed Perks, each of whom will share their thoughts on the outlook and opportunities for 2019. We're also joined by Matthew Slater, Salter, Vice President, Institutional Client Relations at Franklin Templeton Investments, who will introduce our panelists and give a brief overview of what's to be discussed. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. First, I encourage you to submit any questions you have through the questions box in your drop-down menu on the toolbar. Depending on the volume and nature of the questions, we'll try to answer them today, but due to the number of participants on the call, we may not get to them all. So if you don't have an answer to your question on this call, someone can follow up with you directly. Also, an email will be sent to all registrants containing a link to a, to a print-friendly version of today's slides, as well as a recording. So without further ado, let me pass it over to Matthew. Thanks, Ted. I want to thank you all for joining this discuss discussion on Franklin Templeton's outlook for 2019. We plan to cover our current thinking about the global macro environment and markets in the context of our key themes for 2019, distortion, divergence, and diversification. As a former member of the NOI group, it's always a pleasure to welcome this group back. Last fall, we hosted TIMPG at our campus and enjoyed the lively discussions we had over those two days. We hope that trend will continue with this discussion, so please feel free to ask questions. I would like to now introduce our esteemed CIO panel, which constitutes a large part of Franklin Templeton's brain trust. <clears throat> First, we, will, we are joined by Dr. Sonal Desai, PhD. She's an exec executive vice president and chief investment officer of Franklin Templeton's fixed income group, where she was recently promoted. In this role, Dr. Desai oversees Franklin's municipal corporate credit, floating rate securitized multi-sector, global including emerging markets, money market and local asset management and fixed income teams and co-chairs the group's fixed income policy committee. She is a member of Franklin Resources Executive Committee, a small group of companies, top leaders responsible for shaping the firm's overall strategy. In addition, she, she serves on the firm's management and investment committees. Dr. Desai joined Franklin Templeton in 2009 from Thames River Capital in London. She started her career in 1994 as an assistant professor of economics at the University of Pittsburgh, and then worked for over six years at the IMF in Washington, DC. Dr. Desai holds a PhD in economics from Northwestern University and a BA in economics from Delhi University. She was a part of Templeton Global Macro Fund prior to becoming the CIO of the fixed income group. Next on the docket will be Ed Perks, He's Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of Franklin Templeton Multi-Asset Solutions. In this role, Mr. Perks has oversight of a myriad of multi-asset investment capabilities designed to meet clients' needs for specific investment solutions. In addition, he is a member of Franklin Resources Executive Committee, a small group of the company's top leaders responsible for shaping the firm's overall strategy. Mr. Perks joined Franklin Templeton in 1992 
Prior to his current role, he served as Chief Investment Officer of the Franklin Templeton Equity with oversight over Franklin Templeton's equity teams. Mr. Quirks holds a BA in Economics and Political Science from Yale University and is also a CFA charter holder. Lastly, we have Stephen Dover, who is EVP and Head of Equities for Franklin Templeton Investments. Mr. Dover leads all of the company's equity investment teams, including the Franklin Equity Group, Templeton Global Equity Group, Templeton Emerging Markets Group, and Franklin Mutual Series, along with other groups. He's a member as well of the Franklin's Executive Committee, which is responsible for shaping the firm's overall strategy. Prior to serving in his current role, Mr. Dover was CIO for Templeton's Emerging Markets Group, Templeton's private equity partners, and the firm's local asset management teams. Prior to joining Franklin Templeton in 1997, Mr. Dover was a portfolio manager and principal at Newell Associates in Palo Alto, where he co-managed equity assets, including Vanguard's Equity Income Fund. Mr. Dover holds a BA with honors in business administration from Lewis and Clark and an MBA in finance from Wharton. He is also a CFA charter holder. So before I turn it over to Sonal, we would like to pull the group on two important issues using the live polling function. The first question is regarding your interest rate call for 2019. Are we going to look at the results, Ted? Oh, here we go. Yep. Okay, great. Um, I know Sona will have some commentary yeah. on why your forecasts are all wrong, uh, <laughs> but we have one more question for you, which is on your views on the state of the U.S. economy and the likelihood for recession. So can we ask that question, Ted? Okay, great. So as you all know, at Franklin Templeton, we are very active. We are only active managers and Dr. Sonal Desai leads a team of economists and she has some very different opinions, I think, than the, than the grain and is like, it would like to share them. So without further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Sonal Desai. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. So I actually found the polling very interesting, uh, and I need to correct Matt. Uh, I no longer have an entire team of economists who work for me. That was wearing my old hat, but I'm an economist, and I have some working for me. So I think uh, let me first take the Fed uh, take the Fed question. Seventy one percent of the uh, respondents don't think the Fed will raise at all this year, and that certainly is what the market's pricing. The market is pricing, in fact, no more rate hikes ever in the sense that we uh, I'm speaking facetiously but certainly in this cycle the market is pricing no rate hikes this year no rate hikes for next year in fact a rate cut for next year I do think that's probably somewhat misguided if I run through I don't have that much of time so I'm going to spend a very little bit of time focusing very much on U.S. economic fundamentals in particular if I look at the chart which you have up on your screen right now the labor market is incredibly strong. Now, the labor market has been strong for a very long period of time, but in the market, we've become very, we've become almost blasé about the fact that we have unemployment near all-time uh, lows. We have employment definitely at all-time highs, and we continue to see tightness across the board in the labor market. Now, this, if I take it, if I jump ahead to page five of the presentation, if whoever's handling the pages 
takes us there, we are seeing the response on wages that I would expect to see, you know, with such tightness in the labor market. We have tightening wages, we have strong labor, and going very uh, one page further to page six, you'll see that the tight labor market is having the anticipated impact on the Phillips curve, that is the relationship between unemployment and average hourly earnings, which for a large part of this cycle, people said the unemployment rate kept coming down, but wages weren't increasing. As economists, we didn't know why that was happening, we just knew it was happening. Uh, what we had instead was a situation where there was essentially a breakdown of this relationship. Now, more recently, it appears the relationship has come back. This shouldn't be that surprising. Much labor market tightness, it implies that uh, wages at some stage will start responding. When the Fed spoke, when Powell spoke, he made reference to three reasons. He didn't, it sounded like a quick change, a complete change of Fed retro. Fed rhetoric. It was a change, but I would actually analyze that in a very straightforward way. It had very little to do with the fundamentals and everything to do with markets. In particular, he spoke about a slowing global economy. The point is the global economy is not slowing that much. The Eurozone is slowing, but it's still slowing to a pace above potential. If I look at what's happening to China, China is slowing as well, but again, not to a point that would be in consistent with continued global economic strength in the sense that if I look at global GDP growth this year, we're probably looking at a number of around 3.5, 3.6%. The last few years, it's been 3.7, 3.8%. This is not a dramatic slowdown. The Fed also mentioned something about a downgrade to inflation. There hasn't been actual, actually very much downgrading in either inflation expectations or outcomes over the course of that the last few months of last year, for sure, and certainly not yet either. He also mentioned tightening financial conditions. When he's talking about tightening financial conditions, that's essentially the Fed saying they blinked. The equity market sold off and the Fed blinked. So they looked at one piece of the financial conditions index, which is the equity markets, because nothing else was really going on. This would take me to believe that essentially, if you don't continue to see uh, equity markets plummet, and we've already seen a large reversal of that 20% decline that we saw in Q4 of last year, at some stage, once you get a little bit more stability in equity markets, the Fed has the luxury of going back and looking at what's happening to the underlying fundamentals. I would actually be in the camp of the 14% of you who said uh, two rate hikes, and I think the last option was not even put in because I'd say at least two rate hikes in the second half of the year. And I'm going to leave it at that for, for the moment because I want to touch briefly on the issue of recessions, and then definitely leave time, hopefully, at the point of uh, Q&A, if people have other, other, other views. If we go to page 11 of the presentation, I think this is a chart which those of you who came to San Mateo may have seen before. And I want to talk about this a bit, because even back then, I thought that if we get recession, it's likely to be for the first reason that is listed, the first bullet point, which is overexpansion of the real economy. Essentially, this is a long way of saying that CEOs don't have crystal balls they look, that they look into and decide how much to invest. Because historically, if I look at all the recessions after World War II, traditionally, firms have invested, overinvested, inventories have built up, CEOs have gotten over their skis, they pull back, and then they start laying people off. So that's a quick way of saying you've got a business cycle. Now, one thing that has changed, CEOs still don't have a crystal ball, but with, te with the technological advances that we've had in the last five to 10 years, overinvestment and inventory buildup has declined dramatically with just-in-time inventories. You don't have corporations going too far ahead of what is needed. And this is, I think, a quite interesting and uh, important change that has happened from prior episodes of recessions. Almost 50% of the volatility of output historically could be attributed to changes in inventories. And inventories, as you might be aware, 
are a tiny fraction of US GDP. The other reasons that we've had uh, recessions, some have been triggered by oil price shocks. And I think with fracking, with the change in the US in terms of becoming a global oil producer, one of the world's largest, that becomes less, uh, it's certainly become more resilient to oil price shocks globally because we can actually generate supply and uh, we've got new technology there as well. So economies have become less reliant on oil. And then you have that final uh, bullet point, high inflation leading to aggressive rate hikes or just aggressive rate hikes. This is the most dovish Fed that I've ever seen. So I don't think that's going to happen, which takes me actually by uh, elimination to the last potential cause for recession that I see, which is the bursting of a financial bubble. And that's a part which uh, I don't see the imbalances yet. Now, of course, it's, you know, that's those are famous last words, but this is something which me and the team are spending an enormous amount of time on to try and figure out where are the financial bubbles building up and could we get a source? Keep in mind, there's a big difference between a standard recession, which would for me be when the dot-com bubble burst, you got a recession. And what we saw in 2007, eight, which was a leveraged bubble, which burst, which caused a global contraction of GDP. So we aren't actually uh, seeing certainly signs of 2007, eight. But if I look at the early stages of uh, the, the bubble, which we had in 2000, 2001, something to bear that bears uh, looking at for sure. Long way of saying, if I look at uh, the 80% of people who thought that recession would happen between 2020, 2021, I have sympathy for that view, but I think it depends a lot on the idea that the expansion is just too long. So we will get a recession because I, I haven't yet found the smoking gun. And here I would just note that I think it was Australia that had an expansion which was 25 or 27 years long before they actually had a recession. Not suggesting that we're never getting another recession here, but I am saying it might be premature. I'm revisiting the view of when that recession happens. I'm going to stop over here to make sure that uh, uh, my fe fellow pa panelists have a chance to uh, give us uh, their thoughts as well. I think I have Stephen next, is that correct? Do I hand it over, hand the baton over to Stephen now? Yes, I think that's, uh, I think that's correct. Thank you, Sonal, and thank all of you for um, attending this webinar. Um, I am responsible for the equity groups, and most of my career um, actually has been working outside the United States. So um, I think probably you get a lot of information on the United States. So I'm going to try to give a little bit of a more global perspective. And if we can just think, first of all, about how the global economy has evolved, in the 1980s, we really moved from a manufacturing to service economy. After the fall of communism in the late 1990s and 2000s, we really moved, developed economy manufacturing to the emerging markets. Uh, in the early turn of the century, the emerging markets, certainly led by the Chinese, um, led their export growth and in essence overinvested, which uh, Sonal referred to as, as a way that the economy ends up slowing down. So I, I think we're in a place now where we have lower energy prices. Automation is likely to move manufacturing and um, back to uh, developed markets. We're renegotiating some of the trade imbalances that have happened. And China will be moving towards a consumer economy. And as we look forward, I think it's likely that the U.S. will drive global growth with China being the volatile marginal player. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But China's ability to change its monetary and fiscal and government policy rapidly makes it more volatile. Um, and that it means that it has more influence on the global economy than its economy alone would. I mean, we're just having a discussion about whether the U.S. Uh, will change interest rates by 25 basis points. China can make a move of 200 basis points uh, just because it, uh, government has fiat power. Europe. Uh, and particularly Germany, are very vulnerable to these changes in trade and to uh, the changes in China. But other emerging markets could gain uh, from manufacturing moving away from China and developing their own consumer base. Everybody benefits from lower energy prices. Well, not everybody, but most of the world benefits. And if we look at equity prices, equity prices um, are based, in essence, on discounted 
uh, future earnings or a presumption of discounted future earnings at a, at a rate, and as that rate has been very low because of low interest rates, it means companies that have more risk, companies that have more earnings in the future tend to have more value. And in simple terms, in the way we look at it in the uh, equity world that I'm in, it means that growth stocks in general have had a greater value uh, than value stocks because of the of the way that they're discounted. If there were a change, if interest rates were to rise, it's likely that that might reverse and value stocks could come back. So let's turn to China and, tra and trade. And the first point that I always make when talking about China and trade is that uh, this is not, uh, the negotiation, what's happening is not about trade. It's really a, a geopolitical situation. And if you will, China is, uh, the China, China's global uh, geopolitical and economic strategy is pretty easy to understand. China is becoming or trying to become a superpower before it becomes the world's largest nursing home. China has serious demographic issues and to some degree, not completely, but to some degree, demographics is destiny. Now, if we look back at the crisis of 2008, it was China that did the massive stimulation that pulled the world out of the, out of the recession. And it, in essence, over stimulated and has had repercussions from that and its real estate prices and overpricing. China now is slowing down, but as Sonal mentioned, um, it's not heading into a recession. In fact, I, I, I'm at a seminar here um, and the speaker on China just mentioned that China has a recession, meaning a shrinking economy since 1947, including uh, the Great Leap Forward and everything else. But it is slowing down and it's in the middle of a monetary and uh, and uh, fiscal stimulus to offset that. China's dropped its rates down 2%. It's put stimulus to consumers first by tax cuts. It's trying to grow a consumer economy. So the two major moves in China are first, China is trying to move to a consumer economy, and that will really drive the global consumer. And second, that China is becoming more centralized. Xi Jinping is much more of a communist in the old school than previous leaders of China. He wants to increase the state control of companies in the economy. And that's the big move towards made in China. I would, I would remind you that that is an objective, not necessarily what China will be able to do. So when we come to trade with China, we see that it's a geopolitical foreign policy issue that's multifaceted. The next war the United States or the developed markets are likely to get into is a war of artificial intelligence. And you can't have your potential enemy control the information grid. In fact, I would argue that our largest defense companies are probably our technology companies. Trade is a very small portion of the US GDP. You as an audience, um, are more affected by trade because trade is a larger portion of large cap com public company earnings than it is of the main street. So if, if I can say, China trade affects Wall Street much more than it affects Main Street. Now, China in its move towards consumption has some very unique uh, situations. And I just give a quick example. Um, I started going to China uh, 1982 for the first time and I've pretty much been back to China every year since then. So I've known it for a fairly long period of time. And you know, in quickly, when I first went there, it was all bikes. You could literally count the cars. Uh, then it became a lot of cars, bikes were gone. And then they had these bikes sharing and now literally there are mil millions of bikes um, on, the, on the streets. What is uh, uh, to know about China is China has a small amount of arable land and it just doesn't have space to grow. Uh, in terms of where it can put cars. And I, I'm saying this because I think that China has, just as an example, a unique demand for electric cars. In fact, the speaker I heard yesterday said there were 500 local manufacturers of electric cars in China. I don't actually believe that, that's probably components. But the point is China's trying to be a leader. And it needs to be a leader because it doesn't have the space to, um, to park the cars, to have the cars on the road. And it also has very serious um, environmental issues. So I think it's quite likely that China will be a leader in that area and use ride sharing as, as a way uh, to diminish the number of cars and uh, pollution in China. 
So the trade issue or the move towards tariffs uh, is likely to happen on March 1st. I have no crystal ball about the negotiations between uh, the United States and China. But what I will tell you is that whatever the story is, it won't be the last of the trade issue. If there's an announcement on the trade issue that seems positive, I think the equity investors will have a very um, will have a positive reaction to that. From an equity investor's point of view, China is huge, but very underrepresented in the indexes. Uh, put simply, there is no China equity market. China has been divided into a local A-share market with other companies listed overseas. That's changing, and China's starting to be included in the emerging markets indexes. I've spent a great deal of my career being an equity emerging market investor and advisor but I think that it's likely in the future that that idea of emerging markets will be broken up to emerging markets without China and China. And China will be a separate uh, investment just to some degree like Japan is now. But remember, passive investors are passive indexes are very political. And you've probably read some things about MSCI now and that China is pushing to get their A shares to get more representation in the global indexes, which will have a lot of influence uh, on China's impact on global. But investing in China has a lot of risk. Um, it has corporate governance risk sort of from two sides. One side is government intervention in how companies operate. Tencent would be an example. I don't think investors would have expected the government to intervene in allowing gaming uh, within China. The other obvious government issue or uh, government policy issue is the government actually interfering uh, with the managing of the company or not having good shareholder rights. The world needs productivity to keep inflation down, and for that, investment is needed. Particularly in the United States, the United States needs foreign investment. It's tapped out in terms of the consumer and government. So the United States is going to have to bring in corporate, um, is going to have to bring in capital. And what that means is there's going to continuously be a structural trade deficit. It might not be with China, but the trade deficit is not going to go away. Looking at the U.S., um, and I think probably Ed and, and some of some degree have already talked about that. But U.S. companies had obviously a huge earnings um, uh, windfall in 2018, as we saw the tax cuts, uh, fiscal stimulus, and regulatory stimulus, which isn't talked about as much, but was a very big push for a lot of companies. Um, it is very unlikely that we will have as good earnings this year, but we still have very good earnings. I would just um, also make Sonal's point that we do have other countries, such as Australia, that actually hasn't had a recession in 25 years. Recessions don't uh, die of old age. They die, at least historically, of overcapacity. Um, we do see some, and probably the people in this audience know better than I do, manufacturing coming back as energy prices drop um, and as technology uh, becomes more important in the manufacturing price, uh, in the manufacturing process. But that doesn't mean that employment is necessarily going to go up. Energy prices is probably the greatest increase in productivity that we have had in the United States. I would argue that energy is a high tech sector and is very deflationary. It's good for almost every place in the world and has broken down to some degree the ability of the oligopoly OPEC uh, to do the pricing uh, of oil that it has in the past, even with Russia joining it. And it has given some breathing room that alternatives may become viable. If it's true that um, energy prices could remain stable or have a long, long term trend of remaining stable or going down, that will likely be the biggest factor in pro productivity growth going forward. In Europe, we have a lot of news coming up that we just don't know about with Brexit in Italy um, and other issues. The good news is that we're likely to have more certainty in the next few months. A lot of the issue with Europe is uncertainty. So looking forward at the global equity markets, how do we look at things? We probably have had and continue to have somewhat of a US bias, but see a lot of opportunities outside um, of the United States. Um, we see that it's likely that, at least in the short term, low rates will continue but also will uncertainty. 
There's a couple types of uncertainty that I just like to address that I don't think are talked about so much. The, the first is what we call ESG, which is an envi environmental, social, and governance investing, or those factors. This is an area where we see um, somewhat some neglect because of the increase in passive strategies and an opportunity uh, to be a more active manager. Uh, probably one of the most recent examples of that is recently with the iron ore company uh, that built a dam that broke in in Brazil. That that type of factor or looking into the risks that companies have uh, provides an opportunity uh, for investors. And the last thing I want to comment on is volatility uh, in the equity marketplace, which I think is actually structural and is likely to continue or increase uh, going forward. That is because um, when I first started in the industry in the early 80s and there was the theory of efficient markets, indexes were based on the market capitalization of companies. That uh, thinking changed and it changed to looking at the free float of companies with the argument that it's really only free float that investors can invest in and that is how you should measure a more, more efficient index and a more efficient measurement of capital adjustment. Um, passive indexes have changed the free float, arguably changed the free float of the market now that they're about 20% of the market, and that leads to a more sticky uh, investment in companies and a, a, a greater degree of volatility. The other thing that leads to a greater de degree of volatility is algorithmic trading, which really goes in and out of your companies very quickly. If you look at someone like us, we tend to stick with a company we invest in with three to five years. An algorithmic trader goes in and out, could go in and out several times a day, and that leads to volatility. So I think as investors, we need to look at a better policy in terms of how we perhaps regulate or look at how these big movements are going to uh, change the equity market. With that, Ed, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Stephen. Sorry, I just had to uh, unmute myself. Um, so I think, you know, we've heard a lot about, I'm just reflecting back on our, our title to start the, the conversation, uh, distortion, divergence, diversification. I think, you know, clearly Sonal and, and, and Stephen have um, laid uh, out the case for a lot of distortions that are in markets and a lot of divergence. Um, you know, certainly that 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 we've seen or are, are expecting, um, you know, as I reflect on multi-asset solutions, and many of you uh, may be looking at at my title, CIO of multi-asset solutions, and wondering what exactly are multi-asset solutions. Um, I think we're uh, about that third D. A lot of it's about diversification and looking across these broader asset classes. Maybe for those that are also in my time zone, thinking about lunch coming up and wondering what. Uh, uh, what's going to be on the menu today? Uh, I view in many ways fixed income and and, and equity uh, as the uh, the bread, a nice roll, and uh, and multi asset is is all the good stuff that goes in the middle of your sandwich. So with that uh, intro, um, you know, I thought that I would I would uh, start by maybe just touching on a few of the points. This time of year is when we update our capital market expectations, our longer term views, and uh, and, and I think it's it's a good place to start. If you haven't seen the piece, it's certainly available on franklintempleton.com, uh, the 2019 Capital Market Expectations under the highly provocative title, Supportive Environment for Asset Returns. So that's kind of how we roll within uh, multi-asset solutions. You know, but as we do uh, look across this landscape, um, you know, there there is substantial divergence in the fortunes of, of, of different uh, regions within the world, within different nations in terms of expectations for uh, for GDP growth and, and for inflation. As we look out over a cycle, we base our capital market expectations on, on the longer term view, uh, generally looking out five to 10. Here you see our assumptions uh, for seven years, which has historically aligned quite well with the uh, the average business cycle. Uh, the uh, astute observer would certainly uh, know that we're well uh, uh, well past that seven year mark in terms of this economic expansion, and I think that gets uh, at the heart of some of the polling that uh, that Sonal ran uh, prior in terms of expectations for recession. Uh, but also, I think very interesting tying in some of Stephen's comments about 
uh, about that, uh, um, you know, the, the, the life cycle or lifespan potential of, uh, of an economic expansion. So, you know, I think what we do see here in a, uh, uh, fr from a, um, you know, a more of a macro landscape, um, and, and while it certainly has been divergent of late, I think in 2018, um, a lot of that had to do with the extraordinary fiscal stimulus being applied in the U.S. as many regions, emerging markets, and other developed economies, you know, did start to feel a bit of a, a decline in activity. The U.S. had, uh, you know, a little bit of extra fuel to put on the fire, and that created pretty substantial divergence. We do see that uh, uh, waning a bit as we get further kind of uh, uh, past uh, past it, you know, as well as some of the realities, uh, the Fed has taken a, a bit more of an action to remove um, a lot of the monetary stimulus that uh, that did help drive some of the uh, higher growth expectation or or uh, um, environment in the U.S. and and that certainly starts to uh, at some at some point lapse or have more difficult uh, year over year comparisons, and that's one of the things that um, you know we're certainly focused on. You know, additionally. The, uh, the 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 political tensions uh, and uncertainties that exist in uh, in the U.S. I think also have um, you know a role to play in in, in terms of expecting uh, a little bit of a deceleration in in U.S. GDP growth. And you know here we have the different nations on a on a GDP basis. But you know if I were to look um, you know across the landscape and 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 more directionally where we're heading. Um, it's actually a bit more of, of growth expectations converging a bit. So I know divergence has been a big theme for us and certainly something uh, that we've witnessed. I think as we as we move forward, a bit of that slowdown in, in the U.S., um, as well as in other parts of the world. But, you know, I think it's also important to realize there is uh, stabilization in economic expectations, at least from a GDP, you know, growth standpoint, as well as some potential for, you know, for growth. Um, albeit with high levels of uncertainty, certainly the uh, the UK would be probably one of the cleanest examples where you know we do see a broader consensus expectations for higher growth. Uh, although the continued challenge of of working through Brexit, you know, clearly has a a, a substantial uh, or a significant potential, I should say, to ultimately influence that uh, that outcome. Um, in emerging markets, uh, a, a bit of a recovery and potential to move higher, despite uh, a lot of the, I think, good data and, and, and anecdotal uh, views that, that, that Stephen provided on, on China. You know, we'd pivot that and, and consider other regions, whether it be uh, India or Brazil, that um, as we look into 2019 and, and certainly longer term have a potential to see, you know, slightly improving, um, you know, GDP growth from the macro um you know landscape and, and and then just quickly on this slide to touch on inflation um you know there i th i think we we clearly given the stage of the cycle uh, that we're at and I, I i certainly um would agree with um a lot of of the important points sonal made in her presentation um and reason for the outlook that we have across a lot of our fixed income and multi-asset portfolios in terms of uh, duration exposures given the inflation um, you know pressures that we think can, that can continue that have certainly built, but that can continue to build. So, you know, unlike that deceleration in GDP in in many regions, including the U.S., we do not have the same expectation for you know declining inflation expectations um, over time, which does challenge that that broader uh, backdrop. So, to, to flip forward to the next slide, um, you know, Stephen certainly touched on the dynamics in in equity markets and as, as we think about our longer term uh expectations um I, I think it's this broader backdrop and this is the all country world uh index just a simple look at valuations that exist today in equity markets um generally um the re-rating in stocks that was driven by quantitative easing uh for much of this decade you know peaking out at, at relatively uh, what we would describe as more full valuation levels, you know, until fairly recently. And if, and if there's anything that 2018 was about for many equity market participants was a bit of a re-rating, a bit of a cheapening of equities, you know, reflecting a, a, a number of things. And, you know, just to maybe stay on, on this for a bit, 
And I think if we were to pull up, certainly uh, U.S. equities just represent the S&P 500 and, and look at the similar uh, uh, chart, you'd see a, a very similar dynamic, um, maybe a bit more extreme in terms of where valuations got relative to historical averages in late 2017 carrying into 2018. But then that similar, fairly abrupt kind of pullback uh, that's already been mentioned in terms of the terms of the of the decline in, in, in equity prices despite continued earnings growth. So uh, um, the uh, the numerator coming down substantially while the denominator uh, continues to grow, albeit at a, at a slightly uh, you know reduced rate of growth. Uh, we are still expecting um, earnings growth from from U.S. corporations. So what really drive that drove that uh, uh, re-rating lower in in equity prices and you know certainly the um, the Fed has been touched on, and I think that's an important theme for us in our current asset allocation views within multi-asset solutions. That uh, you know, are we facing a a market-led Fed or a Fed-driven market? And I'm not sure we like either of those. But you know, clearly, when you have an eight-week period like we've had, where um, uh, where where Fed policy and and markets, more importantly, taking their their direction and uh, and moving you know fairly substantially certainly at at a, at a level with uh, with short run volatility um, you know substantially higher than where we even think it's settling in on a longer term basis uh, you know because of that a, a Fed hike that uh, that spooked markets that uh, maybe policy was going to be affected with uh, with blinders on and that uh, that ultimately data dependency. Um, um, you know, is something that 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 markets uh, would like to believe in, and and that was the strong pivot that's already been talked about, uh, that has helped create this this uh, V-shaped market that we've had these last um, uh, you know two to to three months, the substantial decline, and then recovery. I, I think it is fair though to say that markets are taking their cues from more than just Fed policy, Fed actions, Fed speak. Um, and 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 some of these other concerns are real as well. Um, in particular, there are certain segments of the global economy that are being impacted by rising uh, rates, particularly in the U.S. Uh, that said, I, I think it's more of an adjustment factor, and and our views fundamentally are that uh, many parts of the economy ultimately can withstand this this rise in longer term rates. And, um, and and ultimately, that is not in of itself a reason for um, investors to expect a significant contraction in, in economic activity. Uh, I think corporate profitability, which Stephen touched on, while it remains um, fairly robust and healthy across a wide range of sectors, um, you know, in the market and economy, I think the forward outlook certainly starts to to, to blur or be a little bit less clear. Uh, for us, Sonal touched on, I think, a key element of that in terms of, of wages and, and the tightness of labor markets and the influence that that can have on markets going forward. Uh, I think you can extend that into equities in terms of the challenge that it could present to corporate profitability. And that's something that, that we, we haven't seen. There's been many calls over the last several years for profits to be peaking or profits to be rolling over. Uh, I certainly recall back in 2015 with the substantial downdraft in the commodity complex and a little bit of a rolling over of profitability on a broad corporate basis. That proved to be short-lived as, as recovery and earnings uh, certainly happened in that sector and, and, and many other uh, uh, industries and sectors proved fairly resilient in their margins. But, but on a go-forward basis, less clarity, less certainty that margins will be maintained as wage pressures potentially build as labor becomes increasingly scarce, as inputs become more challenged. And I think that's where uh, the trade tensions that Stephen touched on, you know, that, that, that clearly um, uh, exist and that have the potential um, just in their nature by having it be a dominant part of the conversation, the potential to create substantial dislocations in supply chains and ultimately uh, negatively impact that broader uh, corporate profitability. So, you know, maybe I know we're getting kind of long in our comments. So maybe I'll try to wrap just by um, talking a little bit about our uh, our asset allocation views. And 
Um, you know, I know in, 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 in conjunction with that very provocative title of for our capital market expectations, um, our expectations are that generally the opportunity and expectations for returns in global stocks exceed those of global bonds. And I know that's also a, um, a fairly straightforward statement. Uh, but it, it, it continues to reflect the backdrop that we think exists, both uh, remaining relatively constructive for, for equities and remaining somewhat challenged for fixed income assets. You know, as a result, our portfolios are generally tilted to reflect that. While not being substantially overweight equities in multi-asset portfolios, we are uh, a bit more defensive in, in, in one respect in fixed income in that we prefer to maintain shorter duration exposures. Um, at the same time, uh, barbelling that, if you will, in many, with continued willingness to have some corporate credit exposures given that favorable backdrop for, for corporate fundamentals. So maybe with that, uh, Matt, I will, I will conclude, and I know we wanted to leave some, some time in case, in case there were some questions, so I'll, I'll turn it back to you now. Great, thank you, panel. Um, Ted, should we open up the line to questions? Yeah, I have a I have a couple, um, or 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 few actually, um, and I can just uh, shoot them out to. Um, I think there's there's one here for Sonal about the Fed, um, so why don't I just dig in? Um, why did the Fed Fed change its rhetoric if growth is so so good? Um, so the I pause if the economy is, is is still going strong. I think the Fed blinked. I think the the probably <laughs> it's not very uh, how should I put it not very diplomatic, but I'd just say that you know that famous Greenspan put, which was followed by a Bernanke put, which was followed by a Yellen put. Well, we just discovered that Powell put is alive and well. Essentially. The Fed exposed, I'd say, tried to rationalize its change of stance. The truth is it came down to the equity market uh, drawdown. Now the question is, uh, would the Fed do that again? I think the Fed has shown that it is not reacting. It was quite pleased. We had a similar, we had market volatility at the start of 20, uh, 2018 as well. The Fed did not actually didn't and the volatility came very much in fixed income markets the fed did not react the same way it's the equity market it seems to react a lot too so my view would be that if markets absorb good data without panicking the fed is likely to raise rates and uh, we can we can actually argue about why we saw the panic it could be for, it could be anything it might have been uh, the story on apple uh, it could have been practically anything. And I have my own views on that. But the bottom line is uh, the Fed seemed to react more to markets. So look at, uh, hearing what Ed said, yeah, it's not a very comforting thought. But I have to say it does appear that the Fed is reacting to market. The Fed's reaction function is building in equity market responses. I'll stop over there to make sure. You know, more if, questions. I just, if I could just jump in on that question, I, I think someone touched on some some great points. and. Uh, you know, I, I think we all have concern that if markets throw a bit of a tantrum, that the, the Fed should not be in a, a position where it's pressured to um, or, or feel like it needs to step in and, and posture itself to stabilize financial assets. And um, I, you know, obviously, we all agree and like the pivot to informing the markets that uh, actual economic data are relevant to policy setting. And, and that, that is uh, what a concept. <laughs> Uh, but that that's generally how 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 you know we're thinking about it as well. Right. And and so now uh, follow up or Ed, um, you said that the Fed was this is the most dovish Fed you've seen. And I uh, is it so more. I thought Yellen was considered uh, I dovish. I Yellen is fair. It's more like this is an extension of. It feels very much like an extension of the Yellen Fed right now. So when I say this Fed, I think Powell is still finding his feet. So I'm not really pinning this on Powell, but I think the Fed, it is an extension of the Yellen Fed that we are seeing right now. Okay, great. Um, and I guess this one is for Stephen. Uh, in terms of trade tensions, 
there have been a few olive branches or acquiescing to some of the demands of the of, of the Trump administration, particularly it's there's a foreign investment law. Um, how are companies? Do you think their companies will feel that they're treated the same way as Chinese companies, and will that help? Um, you know, relations going forward? I think the short answer is no. It's unlikely that U.S. companies will be treated like China companies because uh, the strategy of China is to favor Chinese companies. I think that Trump's strategy, while uh, many of us, including myself, uh, when it first came out, really wondered about trade. I mean, I, my entire career and education has been around free trade, and I thought uh, free trade is something that uh, economists pretty much agreed on 250 years ago. But um, there are issues with the fairness um, of trade, and I'd argue that uh, Trump is uh, playing, I just heard this yesterday, but Trump is playing the crazy uncle strategy, if you will, in the sense that uh, the Chinese don't really know how the United States would react. Uh, Trump has put very hardcore uh, negotiators uh, dealing with China at this point who are not looking at trade. And that's the point that I was trying to make. This is not a trade issue. This is a geopolitical issue. Uh, and if you look at what happened with Huawei, uh, where um, it's certainly a company that has serious corporate uh, governance issues. It's a company that basically uh, is a very strong, good company now, but it's got its original technology uh, from taking it from Western companies. So I think all this puts Western companies in a bind, and, and that's why I was going to ask a question. But I think, and I, it'd be interesting what some of you think, but I think we're at a interesting tipping point as Western companies in the sense that uh, over the last 20 years, we have benefited from primarily manufacturing in China. But if we're to look at the next 20 years, it's likely companies are going to benefit from selling into China. And the question is, is China going to allow that? Is China going to allow the big um, U.S. companies to do that? Now, a particular sensitivity that I guess I have is um, uh, in my career, I've developed offices overseas, including in China. And China has been quite uh, restrictive on the financial uh, uh, services industry within China. Um, and what that does, at least in this negotiation, is it makes China weaker because there isn't a lot of um, America financial services banking, in our case, asset management uh, within China. And uh, for a long, from a long-term strategic point of view, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing for us if China opens up or not. So, sorry, long-winded question, long-winded answer, but I, I think there is no short answer. Um, there may be some agreement on March 1st that may be seen as positive, but that is one step in a very long, uh, to use the Chinese phrase, in a very long march uh, that I see us uh, having with China going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, let's let's wrap it up with one final question for, for all of you. Maybe you can just give a quick answer. Um, what are the biggest risks that you see, uh, I guess, in the next, next year or just going forward? Why don't we start with you, Sanal? Oh, okay. Uh, I'd say that, uh, you know, I ran through every, every, all the reasons uh, that I didn't think a recession would happen. But, you know, we haven't talked about politics because it's completely impossible to predict. But you can't rule out, uh, you know, significant negative real impact coming from political uncertainty. You only have to look at what's happening to the economy in the UK finally two years after Brexit, as we come down the wire, as uncertainty starts having an impact on, in, on uh, investments. So I'll leave it at that. And I'd say that there is political uncertainty related to every question from trade to impeachment, no impeachment. It just goes on and on. So I'd say that's definitely a risk. Great. Uh, Stephen? Stephen? Stephen, I totally concur with Sonal. Um, in fact, we, I'm, I'm here uh, in Miami. I just gave a speech yesterday where we had a poll, um, and that's what 70% of the audience thought. Uh, let's not forget, <laughs> if we could, the United States were rolling right into a political situation where 
Arguably, the Trump administration has spent its last two years trying to undo what the previous administration does. If there is a change uh, in the administration in the next election, they are likely to try to undo everything Trump has done. And that's what, whatever you agree with. It's very, um, it, it's very unstable. Um, the issues in uh, Europe are as much political as they are economic. Um, and even when you look at something like, uh, like China, uh, th this change in China, this move towards uh, how the economy is being reshaped is being reshaped from the top down, from a, from a political uh, point of view, not a purely economic point of view. So certainly um, we are living in a time of great geopolitical risk. I'll turn it over to Ed. Well, under pressure here to come up with something different than political, I, I would certainly agree with those comments. Um, you know, I, I would say, um, and, and maybe one of the lessons that we just learned from, you know, some of the distortions that, uh, that played out in markets is that, you know, we do have some market structural challenges and there are a lot of reasons for uh, for, for this, I think everything from the the dynamic um, and balance between active and passive um, investment um, management to um, the increased role that uh, um, that algorithmic trading uh, has on markets, in particular equity markets, to something as fundamental as the structure of of and character of credit markets, and and there I think when we reflect back on this cycle of easing um you know one of the clear uh, challenges for many investors was a global search for yield anytime you have phenomenal demand for uh, something like yield uh, uh bankers generally are extraordinarily creative and and we're able to come up with products to meet that demand or need and uh and that's an area that we think there are some underlying um um, you know, concerns or just characteristics that we want to be very mindful of if we were to see a prolong prolonged, uh, you know, weakening in markets or, or certainly downturn that's uh, inevitably uh, likely in our future. So, um, you know, those would uh, probably top my list of concerns. This is Stephen, if I could just make an additional comment on, on Ed. Um, a very famous saying that John Templeton said, is you know the worst thing an investor can say is it's different this time and and probably to some degree that the core of how we approach at least on the equity side investing is that um trees don't trees don't grow to the sky and you have to be you know you have to be careful about having this thinking about everything being different so with some trepidation i would say that things are in some ways different and that we are going through a different structure of the economy going forward. And that's why I prefaced my discussion and how, how, how I or we are looking at the equity and markets going. Forward. And a big mistake that I think we make or we as, as observers make is trying to linearly look at history or look at past charts to try to predict the future or say things are repeating. So, so that, would be, that would be my comment. When I look at tons of presentations, you guys hear lots of presentations all the time. I think we have to be careful with how we use um, history to try to predict the future. All right, well, that's about uh, all the time we have today. Thank you so much to our panelists and to our listeners. Um, again, we'll be sending out uh, a recording in the, in the slides. So, Thanks very much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.